Italy, 1943. The Allied invasion of Europe has begun, and tanks of the Canadian Armored Corps experience their baptism of fire. We thought we were invincible, but we weren't. The rookie Canadian tankers face a battle-hardened enemy, intent on holding every inch of ground. Our boys were up against the best German soldiers in the German army. Had to kill those guys. They weren't. They weren't giving up very easy. The Germans throw everything they have into the fight, including scores of their infamous Panther tank. The Sherman didn't have a chance against the Panther. Canadian and German armor go head to head, slugging it out in some of the most ferocious tank battles of the Second World War. This is when you suddenly become aware of just how bloody war can be. Central Italy, south of Rome. Armies have fought for control of these hills for thousands of years. But no battles have been more ferocious or intense than the fighting that erupted here between the Allies and the Germans during the Second World War. The Germans used to shoot from here to down the other side. You get it from there. Doom. Boom. Yeah, pass here. And then you hear from the side, boom, bang, over there. Every day, night, day, act like this. July 10th, 1943. The Allies storm the beaches of Sicily, beginning the invasion of occupied Europe. After six weeks of bitter fighting, the Allies overwhelm the Italian and German defenders and make plans for their conquest of the Italian mainland. Their goal, quickly seize Rome by launching a two-pronged attack with the US 5th Army on the left flank and the British-led 8th Army on the right. And advancing with the 8th Army are the untested Canadians, a mobile unit of 18,000 men. 300 heavy guns, and over 200 tanks. And as this impressive force heads northward, it quickly discovers that its first enemy is the rough Italian terrain. Italy was nothing but uh, a series of ravines and ridges all the way from the boot right straight up to the, to the Alps. But there were a lot of areas where there were very steep hills and uh, high points and so on. We were not well prepared. We were being trained to fight in North Africa, which had no bearing at all for uh, Italy. As the Canadians struggle northward, they encounter little opposition. The Italian government has surrendered leading many to believe that Rome will be liberated in months. But Hitler knows that stopping the Allies here is vital to protecting Germany itself, and he orders his forces to dig in. For the defense of southern Italy, the Germans have amassed six divisions, totaling 95,000 troops, 389 heavy guns, and almost 400 tanks. South of Rome, the Germans established their winter line, a network of pillboxes, barbed wire, and tanks, forming a defensive barrier across the Italian peninsula. But the British, unaware of the extent of the Germans' new fortifications, land troops near the coastal town of Termoli and stumble right into the enemy's lines. The area that the brigade landed uh, happened to be the rest area for the 
German 16th Panzer Division. And the British were very quickly uh, assaulted by the Germans. And they, they cried for help, and we happened to be the closest armored regiment. So uh, uh, we broke through and made a quick dash to Termoli. Rushing to the aid of the beleaguered British are 36 Canadian Sherman tanks. The Sherman 5 is primarily used as an infantry support weapon. Armed with only 51 millimeters of light frontal armor and a low velocity 75 millimeter main cannon, the Sherman sacrifices protection and firepower for increased speed and mobility. We ran from about four o'clock in the morning till four o'clock at night, cross the roads, cross fields. I remember doing radio watch and hearing the German tanks were collecting at a certain point. And we said, boy, somebody's in for hell for the morning. When Captain Yellen came back with the maps, we looked, <laughs> we found that we were the ones that were getting masked against. And they were seasoned troops. It was not a not a, a walkover with them. We pulled up on the uh, high ground uh, just as the Germans were launching another counterattack. We were a fair distance away from B Squad. They were much closer to this wooded area where the Germans emerged from. Once they started moving, then B Squadron tangled with them very quickly. Well, they're firing back and forth, and um, we lost some tanks. We were uh, in a position to give them supporting fire. As soon as I saw it, any German tank, I just gave a quick order to my gunner, and I swung the turret around, and uh, anyway, gave him a fire order, and he fired. B Squadron, uh, they bore the brunt of the battle, and I think they lost two or three. But they, they destroyed eight German tanks. As A and B squadrons watch the enemy withdraw from their sectors, C squadron continues their advance. The British had forged us that there is no, no um, enemy tanks in that area. <laughs> and going across, we noticed a haystack. Having known that the Germans would hide things behind things like that, buildings, and I saw this haystack and wondered what the hell it was doing there, so I fired at it. I hit it with an HE, a high, high explosive. <laughs> when I did, the haystack blew up and uh, this tank appeared. And it was a Mark IV. The Panzer IV is armed with a high-velocity 75-millimeter main cannon that can destroy a Sherman at ranges of up to two kilometers. It is protected with 80 millimeters of frontal armor. But at close range, it can be vulnerable even to the Sherman's underpowered main gun. We usually had an HE in the breach, but if it was a tank, we'd put in an armor-piercing shell, and we fired a, an AP. It burst into flames, and that was it for that. So we continued down the hill up the other side and held our position where we were supposed to be. By day's end, the Canadians prevail at Termoli, 
destroying at least eight German panzers. But the Canadians have lost a third of a squadron in their first major tank-on-tank -tank battle in Italy. A harsh and bloody taste of what is still to come. September 1943. After invading the Italian mainland, Canadian and Allied forces advance northward, intent on seizing Rome. But German forces have prepared for the Allies and engaged the tanks of the Canadian Armored Corps in a fierce battle near the town of Termoli. Termoli was our first battle. It was the first time we had a tank versus tank encounter. Although the Canadian tankers take heavy casualties, they force the enemy to fall back. But in the wake of the battle, the Germans bring in reinforcements and now field 18 army divisions dedicated to halting the Allies. Now, before the Canadians can continue their advance towards Rome, they must secure the heavily reinforced village of San Leonardo. Charged with the task of clearing the village is the infantry of the Seaforth Highlanders, supported by a handful of tanks from the Calgary Regiment. We moved into position on the ridge overlooking San Leonardo, and we were all ready to go. The brigadier comes up and says, they haven't taken the bridgehead. You take it now. I couldn't do anything except, yes, sir. <laughs> This is pretty uh, a dicey way to start going into a battle. No reconnaissance, no idea of what the ground looked like. We went over the ridge and we had, for the first time saw San Leonardo was there looking at us coming down. <laughs> as soon as we got over the, the route, all hell broke loose. And the road was just a winding and steep. On the way down, two of my tanks that were behind me went over the bank. 40 feet. One on one tank on top of the other. And I got into uh, San Leonardo, there were only about four of us, four tanks. We were just supporting the Sea Force, and the Sea Force were clearing the houses. If the infantry were going to go into a house, you could put around in the window. 10 feet from the door without blowing everybody to hell. You could uh, have a tremendous rate of fire. It almost sounded like a machine gun because the loader was just bang, bang, bang. You just kept banging away in that whole area. Slowly and methodically, the Canadians begin to clear the German infantry from San Leonardo. But just as it seems the battle is over, a dozen German tanks charge towards the village, intent on repelling the Allied attack. I think that the Germans had many more tanks in San Leonardo, 10 tanks or 12 tanks or whatever it was. a chap by the name of Arne Charbonneau, and he was one of my uh, troop commanders. And he was positioned covering this road that went out towards the coast. And a German tank went by. And I guess he couldn't have been any more than about <clears throat> 50 yards from Charbonneau's tank. He was coming down behind the buildings. The infantry, the sea force, were on both sides of the buildings. 
And this one little soldier from the Sea Force, this, this German tank was coming right towards him. Charmino hit it and it brewed. A little, little uh, Sea Force soldier came out from behind those buildings and came over and he tapped the tank and he says, you big cast iron son of a bitch, I could kiss you. At the end of the day, we felt pretty good. We were in San Leonardo, uh, it was in our hands and uh, we took it. <laughs> Having secured the village, the Canadians press on, advancing towards their next objective, the coastal town of Ortona. But to get there, they must first seize a road junction, codenamed Cider Crossroads. Now defended by one of the toughest units in the German army. The first parachute division, they were the best troops. They were first class. We had anti-tank warfare. And we had sappers who were setting up mines in buildings. They fought extremely hard, and they made us pay for every bloody house we took. I, I never encountered uh, better soldiers, never. I remember my squadron commander's tank hit a mine. He uh, came up on the air and said to the second in command, come alongside and take off my crew. The second in command said, are there any mines there? And the squadron leader said, no, I hit the only one. And bang, he hits another one. As more and more Allied armor arrives at the crossroads, the German paratroopers begin to withdraw to Ortona, leaving only small rearguard units to slow the advancing Canadians. We were the lead tank. We had one, one troop on one side and one troop on the other side. Melville asked permission from our left to use our path to get around the railroad tracks. So he went ahead of us, and he moved up about 25 yards. The Germans had packed the culvert with 200 pounds of gun cotton. And when the tank got on it, they just pushed the trigger. The turret weighed about seven tons, and it was thrown about 25 yards. and the rest of the crew were blown up. The tank just split into pieces. If Melville hadn't asked permission to leave his position, it would have been our tank. The whole crew was lost. So I remember going back later on and having to bury them, scrape the bodies together and then bury the, bury the duo temporary grave. This is when you first become aware of how bloody war can be. When uh, all of a sudden, uh, one of your friends is no longer there. He's been killed. The Germans stopped us cold. It takes the Canadians 10 days to advance just three kilometers. But on December 19th, they finally capture the Cider Crossroads. The fighting has been fierce, but it pales in comparison to what they'll face next. A battle so deadly, it will become one of the most infamous in Canadian military history. December 1943. For the last three months, Canadian tanks have been engaged in fierce fighting throughout southern Italy. 
and by December 20th, they have battled to within 250 kilometers of their final objective, the Italian capital of Rome. But the Allies' advance has left them with long and very vulnerable supply lines. Allied command knows they must capture a deep water port to keep their advance from stalling, and they order the Canadians to seize the coastal town of Ortona. The Canadians anticipated that we would take Ortona in one day with a squadron of tanks and a company of infantry. Well, it turned out that the, the Germans had a different view. Defending Ortona is the elite 1st Parachute Division, ordered to stop the Canadians at any cost. Our boys were up against the best German soldiers in the German army. You had to kill those guys. They weren't, they weren't giving up very easy. In order to capture the town, the Canadians will have to fight their way through a maze of narrow roads and rubble-strewn laneways. And to protect the vulnerable infantry, the attack is supported by tanks. At just 2.6 meters wide and equipped with a short-barreled cannon, the Sherman 5 can maneuver through Ortona's narrow streets, providing protection and powerful fire support for advancing infantry. Everything was already burning, the houses, and then the tanks arrived. We used to call, tanks up ahead. This was our first encounter in, a, in an urban area. You were always looking around, you, because we just didn't know what the hell we were getting into. From the outskirts, we had literally to fight street by street and house by house. There was a tremendous expenditure of ammunition. Whether or not you saw anyone, you, you still fired. You know, the constant firing was incredible. Basically, our job was in support of infantry. The infantry were quite vulnerable to uh, machine guns. I'd say the Sherman was the best killing infantry gun in the, in the, in the war, by far. The Sherman tank was a great tank as far as that, that part is concerned. The problem was always trying to identify where they were, because the Germans were very adept at camouflaging their machine guns. And our job was to knock these things out, which we did. We destroyed houses. Our, our high explosive rounds had a screw on the, on the head of the round and by twisting this screw, it delayed the, f the impact for 0 0.05 seconds. So when you fired that round, the round would penetrate the wall and then explode inside. After only a few days, the vicious street-to-street -street fighting reduces much of Ortona to ruins, and the ferocity of the battle leads many to refer to the devastated town as Little Stalingrad. When we got back to Ortona on December 20, 1943, we were looking for our house in that area over there, climbing over heaps of rubble. But then we realized that our house had been destroyed. It was just one of the heaps of rubble. Every street in Ortona was filled with rubble. 
heaps of rubble. The cathedral of San Tommaso Apostolo was destroyed. I remember that I was really scared. Really scared because you could be killed from one moment to the next. By December 22nd, the Germans have lost two-thirds of Ortona. But they are not finished with the Canadians yet. And in the north end of the town, they prepare to make their final stand. Because of the artillery fire coming from both sides, the buildings collapsed. And the tanks were only able to drive on very narrow paths. And that way, it was easier to bring them down. We couldn't move on this street. Therefore, we would have to go down that street. And that would be the area they defined as their killing ground. The Germans, uh, for the first time, brought up what they called their Panzerfaust weapon, the, the German anti-tank weapon. Plus the fact the Germans had what we called the sticky bomb. It was a shaped charge that had three magnets on the bottom of it. And they would just drop this thing onto the top of a tank turret as the tank went by and it would latch onto the tank and then blow, and blow all the way through the tank and destroy it. As the battle for Ortona intensifies, the Germans make it clear they will fight to the last man, determined to stop the Canadians, whatever the cost. December 24th, 1943. After four days of bloody street-to-street -street fighting, the Allies have been unable to dislodge the stubborn German defenders from the town of Ortona. And it's the tanks of the Three Rivers Regiment that are ordered to support the advance through the ruined town and finally finish the job. Tanks are at a disadvantage in the city because they don't know what's happening in the debris. We couldn't move on this street, therefore we would have to go down that street. And that would be the area they defined as their killing ground. This was our biggest problem, was the damn sticky bombs and uh, the Panzerfaust. The Panzerfaust was designed as a tank destroyer. It was a very formidable weapon. This was the first time that we, the, it was encountered by the Canadians. The handheld Panzerfaust is one of the deadliest anti-tank weapons on the battlefield. It fires a shaped charge at ranges of up to 30 meters and can penetrate almost 200 millimeters of armor, unleashing a devastating explosion inside. The tanks drove over all the debris and the stones. And there was one of our anti-tank guns standing in one of the side streets, also taking down a few tanks. They had been zeroing in on those streets, so they knew exactly where they were going to fire. And then we were told, fire. Oh, yeah. The only time that A Squadron uh, got into the open was up uh, on the northern end of town. We broke into this uh, piazza. On the left flank is the old 15th century church with the huge doors were open, and the Germans had a machine gun set up by the altar. 
And as the Seaforths went across the square, the machine gun caught them in the flank. I ordered the gunner to start firing. And we blew in the front of the church. The infantry then went in and uh, uh, took out any Germans that were still left in them. And this was on Christmas morning, by the way. The first thing I had to do on Christmas morning. On December 28th, the surviving German paratroopers finally pull out, leaving Ortona to the Canadians. The Battle of Ortona is the deadliest so far in the Italian campaign, leading many to call the last month of 1943 bloody December. We lost more men in Ortona by far than what we lost on the beaches in Normandy. Probably twice as many or three times as many. The fact that there are nearly 1,400 Canadians buried just outside Ortona tells you exactly how difficult the battle was. The Canadian victory at Ortona is bittersweet, as Allied command decides the best way to seize Rome lies further west. The new route of their advance is straight through the Leary Valley, one of the most heavily defended positions on the Germans' infamous Hitler line. Allied intelligence reports an undefended gap in the line near an abandoned airport outside the village of Aquino. But their intelligence couldn't be more wrong. We started out across the airport about, oh, we must have done about 5.30, 6 o'clock. The fog was dense, I mean, and so dense. I mean, you couldn't see 30 feet in front of you. I was touching, practically touching the tank ahead of me. I couldn't even see it, it was that dense. But about halfway, the, the sun came out and they disintegrated that lovely fog that was covering us. And we went right straight across the airport, not knowing what they had sitting there waiting for us. Of course, it's all hell broke loose. The Canadian tanks have just stumbled into an ambush. Four of Germany's deadly accurate new anti-tank weapons, the powerful and very lethal Panther Turm. May 19th, 1944. Canadian tanks and infantry are now less than 150 kilometers from Rome. If they can break through German defenses at Aquino, very little stands in their way. But as they cross an abandoned airport outside the village, they encounter a deadly surprise. And we went right straight across the airport, not knowing what they had sitting there waiting for us. And then, of course, all hell broke loose. The Canadians are among the first to encounter the Germans' newest anti-tank weapon. The Panther Turm is a Panther turret mounted on a concrete base. Its low profile and heavy armor make it almost impossible to destroy. And its high velocity 75 millimeter gun makes it extremely dangerous. Their guns are, were pretty, pretty, pretty rough. This is long barrel 75, same turret and everything as a Panther tank. That was a rude awakening because we didn't even know they were there. So we played a game of ducks that day, and we were the ducks, and the Germans had fun being the hunters. All these guns were intermingled, each supporting each other. So if you got to one, you, 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 the other guy would be shooting at you too. We got across there in one piece, right across in front of those guns. 
and uh, I still had my troop intact. I didn't go very far till I found this nice, comfortable spot. It was kind of a, a hole. I got the two, my two tanks down into it, and I was kind of on the rim. Had I gone on, I went right into that 75 millimeter. Uh, I wouldn't be here today, no doubt in my I had blown my three tanks all I all. We lost about 13 tanks that day. The only thing we could do is call on smoke to smoke those guns out. Around 8 o'clock, we got a good uh, stonk of smoke came in, and finally we got off there before it got dark and uh, got off the airport. Unable to get past the Panther terms at Aquino, the Canadians finally breached the Hitler line further west. They crossed the Melfa River and resume their advance up the main highway towards Rome. By late May, the Allies have cracked the German defenses, and most of the German defenders retreat north of Rome. The German defenses really fell apart, and they had to withdraw, which they hadn't planned to do. So we came up to Taurus Crossroads chasing them, and they put up the battle there. They docked out a number of our tanks, one in C Squadron, and the tank that I had been in uh, 15 days before received a direct hit in the turret. Everybody in the turret was killed, which would have been me. One of our tanks at Taurus Crossroad was hit. It went right through uh, that outer plate, in through, across the tank out the other side, knocked off the, the plate that was welded there, we, which we never did find, and kept on going. Jimmy Barr's tank, uh, with uh, Sandy Scott as gunner, came down the hill, and as they came down at the crossroads, like there, which cut, cut across in an angle, was this uh, German tank. Jimmy Barr's tank uh, immediately engaged. 15 armor-piercing shells at point-blank range, 100 yards away, just bounced off. That just scared the dickens out of the, out of the gunner to fire 15 armor-piercing shots and see them bounce off this thing. When we were in Italy, the Panther came out. It uh, was a new design uh, with even bigger guns on it. The Sherman didn't have a chance against the Panther. The German Panther is one of the most feared tanks of the Second World War. And its sudden appearance on the Italian battlefield is a nightmare for the Canadian tankers. May 1944. Eight months after landing in Italy, Canadian tankers have become battle-hardened warriors, veterans of head-to-head -head clashes with the best the Germans can feel. Now, as they near Rome, they encounter the deadliest tank in the German arsenal, the infamous Panther. 15 armor-piercing shells at point-blank range, 100 yards away, just bounce off. That just scared the dickens out of the, out of the gunner to fire 15 armor-piercing shots and see them bounce off this thing. And I think this is the first time that uh, the Allies had uh, encountered uh, Panthers. The Panther is armed with a high-velocity 75-millimeter main gun, and its sloping front hull gives it the equivalent of 145 millimeters of armor protection making it almost impervious to head-on attacks. But 
One of these shells had, had affected the traverse mechanism and evidently damaged that so the turret wouldn't revolve. Otherwise, they'd have been dead, all of them. And then they hit upon it to put an HC on delay into the bogies. That's the wheels on the side uh, between the tracks. So that was that one. That, that knocked out that tank. We lost, I think, about 11 men there. I was there. there. We took one of the boys out in the shoebox, the tank that had uh, brewed, you know, that's all that was left. And uh, so uh, uh, we buried them there at the, uh, um, uh, by the church, at, right at the crossroads. As more Canadian tanks surge into the Leary Valley, the Germans retreat, and the road to the Eternal City is finally open. But when the Allies enter Rome on June 4th, the Canadians are not among the liberators. The thing that bugged us afterwards, after all this heavy fighting and all the people and tanks and personnel we'd lost, wounded and killed, the American Army commander, Mark Clark, he pulled the Canadians out and let the Americans go in to take Rome. The Allied Fifth Army entered the Eternal City from the south by cheering multitudes. They got the joy and a lot wonderful of coming into Rome as the heroes and the conquerors. We went through Rome at 3 o'clock in the morning. We just whistled through there and said, hello, Rome, goodbye, Rome. And that's the way it was. In all, the bloody fighting of the Italian campaign cost the Canadians hundreds of tanks and 25,000 casualties. It is a heavy sacrifice, but one that helps to dislodge the tenacious German defenders and finally secure the Allied victory in Italy. Practically, the war was already lost by then, but we didn't believe it. I didn't believe it. I'm just very proud of the Canadian soldiers. Where I don't care where the hell it was. I think the Canadian soldiers were damn good. Who had to break the Hitler line? First Canadian Div. Who did our Tawna? First Canadian Div. When I take a look at the 1,375 graves at the Morrow River, I say, no, it wasn't worth the cost. 